Well, welcome to Now That Alliance Church, everyone. My name is Nathan Hunter. I'm the worship pastor here. This is August 1st. Hard to believe August is here. Kids and teachers are preparing their final vacation days of the summer. Families are busy. So I encourage you all to please stay engaged. Stay connected to God and to one another by being here every Sunday. We are a church that is equipping people to find life and faith in Christ. And we do that through connecting with one another. So I encourage you today to connect with somebody maybe that you don't know. Growing in our relationship with Jesus, great way to do that is in small groups. There's one that's starting in Ramsey in, in the end of August. And participating in what God is doing around us. And I mentioned last week that some of you jumped in as a greeter and usher last week. So, so I'm grateful for that. Thank you very much for that. We're still in need of some people participating in tech upstairs and downstairs. Let me know if you'd like to serve on tech for either upstairs or downstairs. I can train you in that category and get you going there. It would be wonderful to have somebody there to sign on the connection card technology and I'll, uh, we'll, I'll direct you to know what that means. So I appreciate that. Also, we have three more family fun nights coming these next three weeks in August. August 4 is the bouncy house night at six o'clock. I'm really looking forward to that. Probably a little bit more than a 50 year old should look forward to hot bounce, not bouncy house night. But movie night is also on August 11th at eight o'clock and a community worship gathering at six o'clock on the 18th of August. So uh, really great opportunities to invite your friends to and, and have fun at. We've had two of those nights already and three more to come. So. Grateful again that you're here. Let's all stand together as we worship Jesus. Yeah, let's stand together. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are here. Uh, let your presence fill this place, fill our heart, fill our, fill our soul. Help us to empty ourselves of the things that are not of you, to surrender to things uh, that uh, we've given ourselves to that are not of you, and then to find uh, find you to fill us and renew us and restore those areas in our life. So Holy Spirit, come. Come and do your thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. Sing it again. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place we have heard the joyful sound Jesus saves Jesus saves spread the tidings all around Jesus saves Jesus saves bear the news to every land Climb the steeps and cross the ways. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shine it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves.
Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This is our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. It is glory just to walk with him whose blood has ransomed me. It is rapture for my soul each day. It is joy divine to feel him near wherever my path may be. Bless the Lord, it's glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. He will guide my steps aright through the veil and o'er the height. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory when the shadows fill to know that he is near. Oh, what joy to simply trust and pray. It is glory to abide with him when skies above are clear. Yes, with him tis glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. He will guide my steps aright to the veil and o'er the height. It is glory just to walk with Him. It will be glory when I walk with Him on heaven's golden shore, never from His side again to stray. It will be glory, wondrous glory, with the Savior evermore, everlasting glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with Him. It is glory just to walk with Him. He will guide my steps aright, through the veil and o'er the height. It is glory just to walk with Him. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we've gathered together, we've gathered together to praise God because of who he is, not just because of who he is, but because of what he's done for us as well, the redeeming and reconciling of us to himself through Christ. One of the ways we best honor that and worship that isn't just through song or through giving, but through celebrating communion together. If you're here in the room and didn't grab communion elements on the way in, but are going to want to participate, you'll still have a few minutes to get those here in a moment. If you're engaging with us digitally, I'd encourage you to get some elements ready for yourselves as well. Today, as we study God's word, we'll particularly be talking about what it looks like to live in peace with the brothers and sisters in Christ and to be unified together. We'll talk about how that doesn't mean that we have to be uh, unified in our opinions about every kind of topic, but that we're unified on who God is and what Christ has done for us. That's important enough that it's one of the few sacraments Jesus left for us to celebrate until he returns to be with us. Communion, celebrating what he's done for us. The bread, celebrating his broken body, and the cup, celebrating his shed blood that saves and redeems us. We'll spend a few moments focused in reverence on those and then celebrating those elements together. But first, a a reminder again of some of Paul's instructions as we do it. It's Paul's writing to the church in Corinth about communion and what it looks like for a church body to celebrate it. He he says it's it's not good to celebrate communion in an unworthy manner, that you need to be worthy as you're celebrating communion. As we interpret that in our own context today, we take that to mean that that if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you should feel free to celebrate communion with the family of Christ here. If you haven't made that decision, 
We'd encourage you not to partake of the elements, but to still reflect on what Jesus' death and resurrection means and what his love for you should mean for you personally as well. Paul goes on to say that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Not only do we hope to be worthy while we do it, but we hope to be uh, reflective, examining. We hope to be intentional with what this looks like. Some of you will choose to do that maybe silently uh, as you think uh, and pray before receiving the elements. Some of you will choose to sing along as another worship song goes during this time. Uh, both of those are appropriate ways for us to prepare our hearts for the elements of communion together. In just a moment, Nathan will lead us in another song of worship, and, and as he does, we'll, we'll examine ourselves, and then I'll come back and, and lead us through the taking of those elements. But before that, I just want to pray that, that as we would do this, it would be honoring of who Christ is and how he's at work in our lives. Would you join me in that prayer? And God, <clears throat> God, it can be easy at moments. <coughs> Excuse me. It can be easy at moments to come and go through the motions of worship. To sing songs that we know or that words are on the screen or to, to celebrate who you are through the community of other people around us and yet uh, to do so without appropriate reflection of who you are. And so I pray as we've gathered to worship that, that it wouldn't just be the motions that we go through but that it would be it would be impactful to us to remember your goodness, to celebrate your position over all of the earth as our creator, as one who loves us and redeems us. Particularly as we get to reflect on that, not just in the generalities of its truth, but as we focus ourselves on Jesus' broken body and shed blood, that in that we wouldn't just see your goodness, but we'd see your love for us the worth, identity, and value that you place in us. We'd submit ourselves to the grace that's extended to us through a body that was broken when it's ours that should have been and through blood that was shed, though it's ours, us who deserve death for our sins. Help us as we prepare to celebrate that, to reflect well, to examine ourselves well, to honor you well as we worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my hope is only jesus for my life is wholly bound to his Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. No. 
no fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said, that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus glory evermore to him when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race, when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, through Christ in me. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Uh, Father, we don't deserve what Christ has done on our behalf. We deserve death. And yet we're thankful for Christ who is willing to walk into that death for us. Amen. To show his power and your power over that death through the resurrection. To show grace that he can extend after that resurrection to us and new life that comes to us. And so we're thankful. Thankful for all you've done. Thankful for the ways that you've shown love to us, extended new life to us. And pray that in response to that, we would be transformed by that love that it would be the foundation by which we make every decision, every action, every thought, every behavior we have centered and rooted in the foundation of your love expressed for us through Christ. Help us as we celebrate communion to reflect on that well, but not just for a moment, in a transformational way that changes how we spend the rest of our days. We pray that knowing it's reliant on work you continually do. And so we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue to praise through song together. And so I'd encourage you, if you're willing and able, to stand with me as we do.
To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life in atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. And all God's people said... Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Well, if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you before, my name is Nate Kemper. I'm the lead pastor here at Now Then Alliance. Love that we gather together each week to worship Jesus. We'll continue to do that this morning in a moment by giving back to God. Uh, we'll have another song of praise together as well as studying God's word together. But uh, first, a couple of things I just want to remind you about. As a church, we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ, and we believe that we do that best as we're connecting with each other, as we're growing in our own relationship with God and encouraging others to do the same, and as we're participating in what God is doing in our lives and in the world around us. And we've got opportunities for you to do all of those things that we want to make you aware of. First, if you're here when if physically with us, I'd encourage you to fill out our connection card. Let us know you're here, particularly if you're new. It's our opportunity to know how we can keep you connected and get all the information to you about opportunities for you to connect. If you're engaging with us digitally, you can do that on the contact forum on our website as well. Uh, maybe more important, though, than your information is on the back side of that card, you can let us know how we can be praying with you. We would love to connect with you in prayer. Maybe that's to celebrate what God has recently done in your lives, or maybe that's something you hope to see God do in your lives that we can come alongside you in praying for. You can fill that out, place it in the offering box that's in the lobby or on the contact form on the website, and we'll join with you in prayer through those things as well. A few other opportunities to connect. You heard about it in the intro video already, but we've still got three more family nights coming up, bounce house night, movie night. And then you may have heard us use the phrase community work worship gathering. That's coming up in a couple of weeks on August 18th, and that's a, a night where a number of the Elk River area churches are going to get together at the Elk River Fairgrounds uh, with food trucks before the service, and then a, a multi-church communal service together, and we're hoping that you'll come participate with that. You'll see some of our staff involved in that service, as well as staff from a number of other churches 
as well. It'll be a great time. And so maybe you've heard family nights and been thinking, well, I don't have kids that these are designed for. I want to be clear, the August 18th multi-church community gathering is for everybody. It's not designed just for kids. It's designed for all believers from all of those churches to come to. I also want to let you know that coming up in a few weeks, actually at the end of the month on August 29th, you'll have opportunity to hear about a number of the different ministries and, and ways that you can participate in them through our church. We'll have a ministry fair on August 29th uh, that can you can maybe learn about ministries you didn't know we had, or you can uh, meet the people that help organize those ministries or sign up to participate and volunteer in those ministries as they kick off again in the fall. And so we're looking forward to that. Hope you'll be here that day as we get ready for that. Some of you may be an opportunity to connect. For some of you, it may be an opportunity to grow in your relationship. But two weeks from today, we have our annual church family picnic and baptism service. And so we'll have our normal services here on Sunday morning. And then after that, we'll head to Twin Lakes Park and we'll provide the meat for lunch and some drinks. But we'd encourage you to bring a side dish or a dessert to share as we uh, just connect with each other as a church family at Twin Lakes. And we'd love to have you there that afternoon with us for that time. And then around 2 o'clock that afternoon, we'll have uh, people that have decided that they're ready to take their faith public through the waters of baptism, and we'll baptize them at the lake. I continue to announce that every week, because so far every week I've announced it, somebody new has signed up. And so maybe you're here and you're thinking, I've ignored Pastor Nate for the last three weeks he's announced it. But I think God's speaking to my spirit, and I think it's time for me to take a step in my faith to publicly profess what Jesus has done in my life and my identification with that through the waters of baptism. If that's true, you can write baptism on the connection card. You can find me or any staff member after the service as well. And we'd love to either answer questions you have about baptism if you have questions, or we'd love to get you ready and get the info you need to be baptized on that day if that's a decision you're ready for as well. I've also got a fun update. Over the course of the last couple of months, myself and a, a search team, uh, Terry Petro, Liz Lorenz, and Karen Kleiman have been actively looking for our next children's director, with Sherry having resigned. We celebrated her last week, and we're hopeful uh, that we would have a children's director in place soon. We posted the job technically at the beginning of May, though we had a few applicants that came in before that. We had dozens of applicants that came in, seven or eight of those that made it through first round interviews, three of those that then made Made it to in-person interviews and then dinners with our committee and uh, all sorts of other parts of the process and over the course of that as a committee we kept uh, being honored and blessed that we had multiple great candidates and that we were getting to choose our favorite amongst multiple great candidates as opposed to just finding somebody that we could be satisfied with or settle towards and at the end of that process uh, we as a committee decided hey, we think we want to offer the job to a girl named Abby. Abby's here. She's going to come join me up here. And so we decided that. And so on Thursday, I went and offered, you can come on up. Uh, we went and offer, I went and offered the job to Abby. The fact that she's here and I'm telling this story, I think you can guess that she said yes to that. And so while we were talking about that, I was like, hey, well, when do you want to start? And she's like, I don't know, maybe sometime next week. And I was like, great. If you want to start on Sunday, you can just come on Sunday. So two days ago or three days ago, I offered the job and she's here already to start. Uh, her and her husband will take a little bit of time um, in, in getting some of their life situation that will adjust because of their job here. They're currently living on campus at Crown and will adjust that to probably be a little closer to us because that commute will get annoying pretty quickly for Abby. But I'm excited to have her. I'll tell you in a moment some of my favorite things about her. But I asked her to just to share a little bit about herself or some fun facts about her. So this is our new children's director, Abby. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Nate said, my name is Abby. Um, my husband here in the front row, this is Noah. Um, we are really excited to be here. Um, so, I don't know, fun facts about me. I am the youngest of six kids. Uh, I just graduated with my degree in children and family from Crown back in May, so it only took me six years. It yeah. was just a minor, you know. Yeah, okay. um, I attended three different colleges. Um, I prefer pineapple on my pizza. Yes. Yeah. So it's a good solid choice. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Just uh, you ask me questions and I'll give you answers. <laughs> As we were doing interviews, a couple of things that stood out, maybe my favorite thing that stood out 
uh, about Abby, uh, different than all the other candidates that uh, we have hired before or sent, and uh, all the other ones that we were interviewing. Abby has a clear passion and conviction, not just for how kids get reached for Christ in the ministries of this church, but particularly uh, for what that looks like in the home. And her heart for family ministry and her vision for family ministry is greater than I had seen from any other candidate and any other church I've worked with before. A number of times we'd ask questions like, well, what would you do if this kind of uh, criticism, complaint, situation came up uh, with a congregant, with a parent, with, with somebody in the church? And she would continue to say, that sounds like another great opportunity to train somebody on what it looks like to do ministry well in the home. To adjust what we can with the program here to help meet those concerns, but to also use that as a springboard for equipping people for family ministry in their home. And that stood out as one of the favorite things of our committee. Also, she's just really likable. Every time we met with her, it was a phone call, it was interviews with the committee, we had some other people that joined for dinners, everybody left and said, man, I just really like her. She's really easy to talk to, really easy to get along with. And then maybe the most important, they decided to sit in the front row. And none of you all ever decide to sit in the front row. And so I'm thankful for that as well. Uh, after the service, if you've got time, come introduce yourself. I want to encourage you the same time I would any time we hire a new staff. And then next week when you see her, and two weeks from now when you see her, and a month from now when you see her, say your name again, because she's going to be learning lots of them. Uh, and so if you'll just take the awkwardness of that away and reintroduce yourself with your name for a few weeks or months as she's getting used to things around here, that'll be helpful for her as well. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're excited to have you. You can go on back down. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. But when I do, I'm also going to be praying for our offering. Like I said, many of us choose to worship not just through song or communion, by, but by giving back to God some of what he's blessed us with. If you're new here, if you're visiting here, I don't want you to feel any pressure or obligation to give. Though if you would like to join us in worshiping God in this way, you can do so physically through the offering box that's in the lobby behind us, or you, anybody can give digitally at nowthenalliance.org. There's a give tab there that can walk you through all the instructions on what that looks like. As we get ready to give those gifts, I want to pray to God on how they'd be received and how he would use them. I want to pray for Abby as she begins her time here as well. Would you join me in that prayer? God, I'm thankful uh, that you have worked through a process that was in place to help discern uh, what was the right fit for our church in leading our children, our families, and the children of the community that surrounds us into deeper relationship with you or into first-time relationship with you. And we're thankful that through that process, uh, Abby has accepted the call on her life from you uh, to come do that in this local representation of your kingdom. And so we pray for fruit from that, fruit that encourages Abby, fruit that encourages us, most importantly, fruit that uh, is beneficial to your kingdom that changes lives in our church and in the community that surrounds us. And we long to see and celebrate that work that you will do in this time. And we pray then as we worship you uh, through gifts and offerings that, that it would be pleasing and acceptable to you as an act of worship and that you would use these gifts to spread your love and to grow your kingdom in a world that could desperately use more of it. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to sing with me. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth, thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt
sing it again. For thou, O Lord. For thou, O Lord. Sing to him. Art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh Lord, I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh Lord, one more time, I exalt thee. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, oh Lord, I exalt thee, I exalt thee. I exalt thee, O Lord. Amen. We're eight months into a year long series talking about the rhythms of life. 2020, a year that threw most of our rhythms off, we decided to focus in 2021 not on returning to the rhythms that used to be, but making sure the rhythms of our life align with what God has for us and intends for us. And so we spent the first portion of the year talking about our own personal rhythms with God. We spent the second portion of the year talking about what it looks like to be in right rhythms with our families, and then have transitioned in the last month or so to talking about what it looks like to be in right rhythms with other believers. We looked at the fact that there's a hundred different times that the phrase each other or one another is used in the New Testament on the course of 94 different verses with 59 unique instructions or commands that come out of those verses. Last week, we began looking at one of those more in depth as we looked at what it looks like to encourage one another, how we use our words. One of the applications came from Ephesians 4.29, uh, which was to essentially set an alarm for 4.29 every day. And at 4.29, remind yourself to encourage somebody. This is what Ephesians 4.29 said, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I don't always get to know how this plays out in some of your all's lives, and if you put into practice some of the things that have been recommended, but I know at least a few of you either set alarms or were just really attentive to the time of day, because multiple times this week people sent me encouragement at 4.29 in the afternoon. I was thankful for it, thankful for the way that we can use our words in the midst of those kinds of moments to remind ourselves of what God says we should be like when we engage with one another. Let's be clear, though. It gets a lot more important than just what do our words look like. Jesus says things not just of our words, but our thoughts as well. In the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking to the believers at the time about, about some of the old covenant law and what it looks like instead as he's come and brought the kingdom here, uh, what, what new instruction he's giving. Matthew chapter 5, he's talking particularly about murder at that moment and says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you should not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But look at what verse 22 says right after that. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. 
Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. This is not, it's not good enough to just have occasional encouraging words of other people. Jesus says, no, you need to make sure you're not angry. You need to make sure that, that you're not calling anyone a fool. Because if you do, you're in danger of the fire of hell. Your anger, your foolish words may be putting you in danger of the fire of hell. And don't, don't even call someone a fool. Maybe you hear that and you have a uh, reaction to say, uh, but Pastor Nate, aren't some things just foolish? Like, aren't, aren't some topics worth commenting about? Isn't, aren't we supposed to address these kinds of things and correct these misdeeds? And so if somebody's thinking the wrong thing, shouldn't we let them know? This has shown up maybe more in the last two years than any other time of life for me. Let me give some examples. In the last two years, things that at some level our world, but for sure the church at large and our local church, have had topics and conversations and wondered who's being foolish about. Just a few words. Mask mandates, politics, social justice, gender and sexuality, racism, gun control, the role of women, Bible and science as it relates to creation, hymns or contemporary music, the timing of Jesus' return, school curriculums, church curriculums, conspiracy theories, how much effort we put towards digital ministry. Is NASCAR really a sport? (laughs) I just was already getting uncomfortable saying all of the other ones. Nobody really that I know of was having a large debate about if NASCAR is really a sport. The rest of the list is things that The world has been divided over. Churches have been divided over. Sadly, while the world has been in debate and and contrast around most of those topics, the church hasn't been any better than the rest of the world. I was reading a book recently that said since 1054 AD, the Christian church has been the most divided religion of all major world religions. We have more groups and denominations and factions than any other major world religion does. In the midst of that, in our own country, people would say, and Sunday morning at this hour is the most divided and segregated time of the week in our country. And so we've looked at these things and we've turned towards finding our own opinions, and that's appropriate but then towards calling everyone that doesn't share them fools. And our disagreements on those topics aren't what put us in danger. But Jesus says our anger and our willingness to call other people fools is what puts us in danger. Francis Chan, in his recent book, Until Unity, talks about these kinds of disagreements. And and when he does so, he says that the church, it's clear, is allowed to disagree on lots of things. Uh, Romans will call them disputable matters. And that we shouldn't shouldn't get too hung up on these disputable matters. But when Francis Chan is talking about it, he says, "Here's here's the true reality of a church. When your love for each other is shallow, your disagreements become divisions. When your love is shallow, your disagreements become divisions. It's okay to disagree. Many of us do on lots of those issues. But our love for each other is supposed to be strong enough that they remain disagreements and don't turn into divisions. It's in that same chapter in Romans 14 where Paul is talking about those disputable matters that he gives some clear instruction on what that's supposed to mean for us. He talks about how that's happening in the church and that it shouldn't be what divides us. And then he gives this clear expression in Romans 14 verse 13. Here's what he says. Therefore, 
let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Because we're allowed to disagree and that our disagreements don't have to mean we're divided, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Your primary job as it relates to the family of God and the brothers and sisters we do life with here in the church is not to critique each other. Your primary job is not to judge each other. Your primary job is to love each other. And we don't need to feel bad when we disagree. Scripture's fine with that. But we should feel bad and we should be grieved if our disagreements have led us to division and have led us to anger. It's a simple question. It's for your own self-reflection. How are you doing with that? Are you angry at people who disagree with you? Jesus goes on to show that our self-reflection about this isn't enough, though. And just deciding, like, oh, I've made a mistake. I guess I'll pray and confess. That's a step we should take, but that's not enough. That's, that's not the end goal Jesus has for what the unity of the church would look like, what it looks like to be at peace with each other. As he continues in that same message in the Sermon on the Mount, he continues in verse 23, he says it this way, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, so like if you've come to worship, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Jesus essentially says, I'm going to paraphrase now, worship isn't actually happening if you have discord and dis division in the body. It needs to stop. You shouldn't engage with it. You shouldn't continue until you go and reconcile those divisions. Leave your gift there. Leave the sanctuary. And go and be reconciled to them and then come back and do the worship. Your worship, your worship isn't pleasing to God if it's in a state of disobedience with the clear things Jesus has said. And so the question then becomes even more pointed. Do we do this? Like, is it as serious to us as it seems to be to Jesus that we would remain at peace with each other, that we would remain unified, that we would remain a reconciled body? Or are we, like all many of the churches in the world around us, just allowing these things to divide us, to cause anger, to put us in danger of the fire of hell? Those are Jesus' words. Do we believe Jesus' teachings about our thoughts and who we're calling fools and who we disagree with are as serious as he believes they are? Again, I'll use Francis Chan's words in that same book until unity. He, he made a, a pointed observation. He said, I have found it strange that if I preach the Bible's stance on sexual purity, I'm called a conservative and considered to have a biblical worldview. But if I preach the Bible's stance on unity, I'm called a liberal and that I've compromised on the Bible and focused too much on simple love. Do you read the commands of Jesus as seriously about the unity of the church and your relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ as you do about the things you hate in other people, like idolatry and witchcraft, sexual expression out of marriage. The New Testament is clear that we're supposed to be at peace with each other and united with each other. And that when that's not happening, it's an outpouring of our flesh. Uh, Paul describes those acts, what it looks like to, to be living out the flesh. 
in Galatians chapter 5 before he's going to contrast that with the life of the Spirit. This is what Paul lists. Galatians 5.19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Many of us will read through a text like that, a list like that, and what we'll see is this quick checklist where we start to say, well, I don't find myself sexually immoral. I'm not debaucherous. I'm not engaged in witchcraft or idolatry. I haven't gone to any orgies. I'm not getting drunk all the time. I must be good while we ignore hatred discord, jealousy we may have of other people, the rage or selfish ambition, the dissensions, the factions and rivalries, the envy. We look at one of the parts of the list and we say that's the part God's really talking about and then parts of the list we just gloss over. It can't really be that serious, right? No, no, no. In Paul's list to the church in Galatia, he says, no, your discord, your rage, your jealousy, your dissensions, your rivalries, if you have those, I want to be clear again, if you have those, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Paul isn't mixing words. It's not just a list of the individual behaviors that we can judge on the outside. It's the way we treat our brothers and sisters in the church. And if we would look at the stats right now, churches are divided. And Paul says that means we should be concerned about if we'll even inherit the kingdom of God. The immediately thing that that Paul does is he contrasts that, that list of what our flesh looks like with the life of the Spirit. He says, instead, if you're walking out the life of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit would be true in you. Many of you have memorized that list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These would be the things that, that are on display as we walk in life with the Spirit. It would be what's valuable and centered to us. question that Francis Chan posed. He says, do you, do you recognize, do you recognize that if that hatred, that discord, the division is within you, you might not inherit the kingdom of God? Maybe more importantly, he says, do you recognize it might be a sign that you don't even have the spirit of God inside of you? I'll say this again later, but the answer isn't to just try harder to like people. The answer isn't just to work yourself out of dissensions and divisions. The answer is to surrender yourself to a life of the Spirit. Because a life lived in the Spirit will produce love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. And if that's not what's present, if decisions, or dissensions and discords and factions and envy and rivalries are what is present in your life, it is because of an absence of the Holy Spirit. You've walked with the flesh instead of with God. For all too many of us, we've done it flippantly. We've treated, we've treated division in the church like we treat our national debt. It's something we see growing all the time around us. But because it doesn't necessarily affect our daily life, we just live like it doesn't exist. We move on like it doesn't really matter. The Bible says it does. Uh, for a moment, I just want to read through some verses. Some of them may be paraphrased. Some of them may be read word for word. 
and that remind us of the clarity God has about the unity we're supposed to have with each other, how we're supposed to be at peace with each other. And as I read through them, I want to remind us to listen to them with the same fervor we may listen to commands about clear passages on eating food or having sex. The clear commands of God and take them as literally as we take some of those other commands. Mark chapter 9, Jesus encourages and commands us, be at peace with one another. He says in John chapter 6, don't grumble amongst one another. Romans 12 and Romans 15, be of the same mind with one another. Accept one another. Don't boastfully challenge or envy one another. Be gentle and patient and tolerant with each other. Bear with and forgive each other. Seek the good for one another and do not repay evil for evil. Stop complaining against one another. In First Timothy, I'll read, or Second Timothy, I'll read a slightly longer quote. Paul's words: "Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels." And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, that they would come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Scripture's clear. We're supposed to be at peace. We're supposed to be gentle. We're supposed to be loving. We're supposed to bear with each other. The disagreements can happen, and when they do, our response to that is also supposed to be gentle, not angry. Let's be even more clear. Jesus' commands and hopes about this, Paul's commands and hopes about this, weren't simply so we could feel good when our head hits the pillow at night so that we could rest well because we have peace. That would be great also. And for many of us, we would long for just that to be true. But God's been clear. It's also part of the mission Christ has for us. Uh, Let's read from Jesus' words as he's praying to the Father just before he's arrested. Listen listen to his heart. And, And while you listen, ask yourself, if you believe this could actually happen. Like now, not not just when we're in heaven, if this could happen now. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prays for our unity. He prays that we would experience that not just in heaven, but now. And as a response to that, part of his mission on how the rest of the world would come into right relationship with God is that because of our complete unity, the world would know that Christ was sent and that they are loved. The world would know that they're loved by God because of the unity of the church. God says that the lost will be drawn to him because of the unity of the church. 
Do you believe that? Do you believe that can happen? Do you believe that can happen now? Or do we fall into the trap of saying, hey God, that's a great plan, but it doesn't make sense to us. So instead, we'll, we like our strategies and our programs better. And so we'll continue to just create a new ministry, create a new strategy. We'll draw people with whatever means to get them into the church. Because that's just easier, better, and it's a more clear path to how they would come to know the truth of who you are than us simply loving each other well. Have we relied on strategies and programs have we relied on what we can add to the equation? Or are we willing to do what Jesus says is God's plan for reaching the world? The church to live in union, unity, and love with each other so that the world sees, believes, and joins. So the peace and the unity isn't just so that we could feel good. It's because lost people matter. And God says that's one of the ways he wants to reach them. Scripture isn't against us also having programs and strategies. But if we're ignoring one of the clear ones he's given us, I imagine our programs and strategies wouldn't be very effective. If we're divided... It won't just feel uncomfortable or look ugly. It will make us dysfunctional as the people of God. We'll cease to be able to do the functions God has created for us to do because our unity is important to that. And so our collective strategy for reaching the world can't just start with legislating God's rules and programs at a building. It has to start foundational on the unity God offers to us through his spirit. And so I would encourage us to believe him, to try it. Again, we can't try it by just increasing our own efforts towards liking people. We try it by surrendering ourselves to the Spirit, by, by not walking in a life of the flesh which creates these kinds of divisions, but by surrendering to the Spirit which creates an entirely different kind of fruit. We try it not just by, by understanding that we're supposed to be at peace with each other, but that Jesus also says we're supposed to be peacemakers in our lives as well. And my hope is that we'd be up to that task each week, many of you have gotten familiar with this, I try to give us some steps that we can take in response to what we've seen in God's word. And ideally, I'll give an idea or an application uh, for each of our church's core values, a way we can do this if you're looking to connect with others, a way you can do it if you're looking to grow, a way that you're looking, you can do this if you're looking to participate. And so, so here's some examples. If one of them God uses in your life, that's great. If you've got something else God wants to do in your life, listen to and obey that. If you're looking to, to help be at peace or to create unity in the church while connecting with someone others, this is a hard step, but it's a simple one. It's Jesus's, so if we do it, it's probably pretty helpful. Go and reconcile with someone. And let me be clear, that reconciliation might not mean you actually come to agreement with them. It may mean a simple step of going from division back to just disagreeing and not letting it divide you. Go and confess, I've allowed our difference on this issue to come between us. It's created a division. That's because of my flesh. I don't want that to be the case. Can we just agree to disagree and move from division to disagreement, reconcile? And I encourage you, if you can think of somebody that that may be a need for you, please do it before you come back and worship next week. That's Jesus' instructions for us. Instead, you may be thinking, I'm looking to grow in my own relationship with God. Is there, is there an application, that a step I could take? Yeah, of course there is. I go to Google or Bible Gateway or a, another favorite Bible website and just read 
do a word search in English and read what God says about quarrels and discord and division. There'll be lots of verses about all three of those words. And then you can read about what God says about being at peace and having unity. There'll be lots of verses about those as well. And as you read about those things and see the lists of those things, take them as seriously as other, every other part of scripture you take seriously. Find how passionate God is about these things and how his people respond to them and begin to put it into practice. If you're looking to participate, this one's a less clear step, but maybe the most important thing a number of you can do or a number of us can do. Don't just try harder, but surrender to the Spirit. You're saying, but Pastor, I don't even know what you mean by that. Well, that may look different for a number of us. It may be a simple prayer of confession and request and petition to God. God, I confess that I have feelings of anger. That there are people I want to call foolish. That I have division from some I disagree with. Maybe you get more specific and it's about these particular areas. I have found I'm, my passion overruns in these particular disputable matters. And I'm just acknowledging that that means I've lived a life of the flesh. That's what your word says. That's what Paul says. And I don't want that. And so, God, I just want to give control back to you. I want to surrender to you. I want to have the areas I've held on to too tightly filled by your spirit that you gift to us. So that the things I've been feeling and saying and doing would re be replaced by the fruit your spirit offers to give in my life. And surrender again, control of those things so that you would live in step with the spirit. For most of us, that's not something we can just do once and find perfection in. And so you may find yourself needing to do that consistently throughout the weeks. If you're the kind of person who's setting an alarm for 429 to remind yourself to encourage others was helpful, you may set an alarm for 522 to be reminded of the fruit of the Spirit. Pray and surrender that you would walk in step with the Spirit each day this week. Regardless of if you choose those things or if God speaks something else to you, the hope is that we would become a people individually and collectively that live at peace with each other. Again, not just so that we feel good, but so that we can reach the world around us that desperately needs to know who God is. That we would be unified together. Imagine what a witness that would be. Imagine how engaged people would be when they came into our presence, how encouraged and lifted up they would be. Imagine how honoring it would be of Christ and the prayer he prayed to the Father. Imagine even more how beneficial it would be for the kingdom as God says he would use it to bring the lost into relationship with him. And as we can imagine it, let's go do it. God, we aim to please you to follow what you've commanded of us. To do it in the unity you've commanded of us and at peace with each other. And yet we recognize that's not something we can work ourselves toward. But it's something we can do as we've surrendered to your spirit. And so please fill us anew. Overtake the parts of us we've closed off, taken back, or seized control of. Help us to live not just in the flesh that we have, but to give that up and instead live a life in your spirit. We pray for our peace and unity with our brothers and sisters in this church and in the world around us because of the work you do in our lives and because of the work you want to do in the lives of the lost around us. Do that in powerful ways that only you can, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go, I'd encourage you to go with grace and peace. If you're looking for opportunity to connect with others, you can 
head to the cafe and spend some time there. You can connect with people in here. You can grow in your relationship with God in Sunday school downstairs. And you can come meet Abby. Make sure you introduce yourself by name to her and do that over and over and over again as well. Go with grace and peace this morning. You are dismissed.